Good morning. It's been a while since I had the privilege of coming over to Grace. For a while back, I used to preach at this lectern when it was in a basement at a parsonage. And then one of the times I was over here, we had a little accident with my friend here and my friend there. And I'm glad they're both fixed up again. So it's a privilege to be with you today. I want to use the uh, Old Testament lesson that it was appointed for today, which wasn't read, but which I'd like to share with you. These are words from Isaiah in the 35th chapter, verses 4 to 7. The prophet says, Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong and do not fear. God will come. He will come with vengeance. With divine retribution, he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue will shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. These are the words of our text. These are interesting times for the church. The church and the Christian faith in particular seem to be attacked almost every day by some group that claims they want to take up whatever we have in our nation under God and try to get rid of those terms. We even found that the president of our synod had to go to Washington to testify in a hearing of the House Committee because the President of the United States and the administration was trying to impose himself in the place of the teachings of the church. I would remind you, it's not just the Roman Catholic Church that feels attacked and is fighting back to defend itself. We Lutherans are very much involved and ought to be. There are groups in our country that are trying to take our faith away from us. I'll even mention one, the American Civil Liberties Union. So I signed up with the American Civil Rights Union, which decided to take them on in court, and I will try to support them in their endeavors. But wherever we turn today, the church seems to be under attack. Somebody said, this isn't really a good time to be the church anymore. But I believe it's the best time to be the church. Because that's exactly where God called his church to be. In the center of the turmoil, with the sure message of God's grace in Jesus Christ, prepared to proclaim it to all who want to hear it or not, because that's who we are. We don't apologize for our faith. We want to find opportunities to show what our faith is and to proclaim it clearly. So I think it's a great time to be the church. But we're also in a time where there's not a whole lot of joy, except for here at Grace, of course. <laughs> I would never want you to think I was finding fault with you for a lack of joy. But our world is filled with a lack of joy. All we hear about is negativism everywhere. Political campaigns have turned more nasty than any of us can ever remember. Negativism is all around us. Jobs are at a premium and being lost more and more. Finances are in difficulty and we're not sure. If you were listening to the, second, the first lesson that was read from James, it sounds like the argument between the Republicans and the Democrats today the fight between rich and poor, which we really don't need in our country right now. We need more healing and forgiveness and the love of God as he's revealed it in Jesus Christ. Where does the church turn at a time like this? But then I think, where but in the church do you even hear the word joy in today's world? Where in the church are you called to be together with brothers and sisters in Christ to proclaim the forgiveness that you appreciate 
and to share it with those around you. Where but in the church would any of us even dare to stand up and say that we are poor, miserable sinners and need forgiveness from a loving God? I was at a pastor's conference one time not even too many years ago where one of the pastors boldly stood up and said, I'm not going to let anybody call my people poor, miserable sinners anymore. We won't use that con title in our church. We've outlawed it. And boy, did we pastors jump all over him. Because that's what God had called him to be in his church, to direct people's thoughts away from themselves, to recognize the severity of sin, and to proclaim the joy in knowing that God forgives our sins. He's forgiven the iniquity of our sin. God didn't take our sin away. It's still there with us every day. So we come every week and confess it and know we're going to go back and have problems all over again. Out of the heart, we heard last week, proceeds the sin that we have all around us. Well, as we look at the work of the church today, we have to realize that a lot of people are dropping out, disengaging from the organized religion in which they were bought, born and brought up and raised. Someone recently wrote a book and say, Why You Lost Me. And they proclaim in that book why certain people give up being involved in the work of the church. They list six things. I'll just mention them in passing. The first one they mention is that the church seems to be overprotective. It doesn't allow me any latitude or creativity in my life. It seems to be confining. And so they stay away from the church because they think the church is overly protective of them. Well, they've never been in a church that I've been in because I don't think that's ever been a problem anywhere that I have ever had the privilege of serving. Secondly, they say that at times the church seems to be too shallow. The church is talking about pious platitudes. It's talking about proof texts. It's talking about slogans. Well, that may be true, but didn't Paul say something about nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord? And so mistakes in the church can't separate us from him either. The third one they mention is that the church to them seems anti-science. So they found out that they, in their lives, thought that the church was against science and it was for the Bible. And since they began to think they couldn't believe both, they decided to take the science route and give up God. Well, those people never had the privilege of knowing Fred Trinkline, who used to be a member of this congregation, and under the blessing of God, helped all of us walk through the reality that there's not a conflict between science and religion at all. It's in your mind. It's what you think it is, but it isn't a reality. Those who are really scientists have room in their hearts and lives even for God. They may not all speak about it at times, but I met a guy once and I invited him to come to church. He said, you don't know where I work. I said, I didn't ask you where you worked. I asked you to come to church. He said, well, I work at Brookhaven National Laboratory. I said, good for you. We'll even accept you in church. Come on over. He wasn't going to get me to back away and to get me to believe that science is going to replace God in my life or in his. Another one, they said that rules in the church seem to stifle some individualism in the world in which we live is filled with individualism. So they feel that they're being hemmed in by some kind of rules, particularly some of the moral decisions that are recorded for us in scripture. And isn't that what our society is fighting all the time? Does the Bible really say something about that? If it does, then we as a church need to proclaim it, and we as Christians need to enjoy proclaiming it as well. And lastly, they said the church seems to be kind of exclusive. It has a message that you're saved by grace through faith, 
and that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, you and I better not apologize for that belief because that's precisely what the Bible says. And so if people want to be more open-minded and try to have more tolerance and are therefore afraid to proclaim the grace of God in Jesus Christ, then they better go back to confirmation class and start over because they're missing out on a great privilege that God gives every one of us. Some people stay away from church, I understand, because they don't think they can express any doubts in the church, as if the church has all the answers. Well, those of us who have been involved with it for years know that's not the case either. There's room in the church for doubts. Can you really explain the teaching of the Bible about the Trinity? We believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's an article of our faith. Nobody can explain it to anybody's satisfaction, but we can proclaim it. And in the proclaiming of it, we know that God is at work by his grace and converting people to his life. So as we look in the message of Isaiah, who spoke about 700 years before Christ, he was talking to a world which was full of chaos and danger. There were governments in, all around Israel who were threatening their very life. Sounds very similar to today. And so Isaiah was sent by God to declare to the people that God has not forgotten about them. He will be with them in their times of doubt and frustration. He will be with them to strengthen them and help them. He will come, oh yes, he will come, and with vengeance punish their enemies. But as far as they're concerned, he says he will come to save you. And so in the midst of their chaos, when the Assyrian government was right at their doorstep, Isaiah stepped forward and proclaimed the promises of God and he wanted to become somebody who had a courageous confession and encourage the people to be helpers of joy as they lived their lives, contrary to everything they saw around themselves. And look what he says. When God comes with his promise and his mercy, things begin to happen. Things that seem normal in nature get reversed and turned completely around. Look at the list. The blind will see. The deaf will hear. People who are lame will begin to leap like a deer might be leaping. The mute people will speak up and water will appear of all places in the desert and in the parched land. God will reverse everything that you thought was permanent and he will make all things new for you. As we look at our own development in the faith, we want to confess that we have experienced that joy in our lives where we, who were deaf to the invitation of God, have made it possible for us to hear it and to believe it. We who are blind to all of the great things that God has done has now made us astute to look and see the wonders and the power and the grace of God. We, who were lame and not able to get around, are made alive in the gospel of God's grace. All these things are signs that God has come to be among his people and to save them. In today's gospel, we heard the reading that it actually happened to a man who was born deaf and mute that Jesus healed him. And what did the people say? First, it says the people were astonished that it happened, and then they proclaimed that Jesus did everything just right. Not just for that man, but for them as well. People were astounded what they believed that Jesus was who he said he was. So despite what we see going around in our world today, despite the forces that are trying to overcome and annihilate the church, whatever is all around us and troubling us, we still know about a God of mercy and a God of grace who will come to help us 
in our time of need. And because of that, we want to be helpers of that joy and learn how to not only appreciate it for ourselves, but to be equipped so that we can go out and share that joy to people who may be in any kind of trouble. We want to learn to become living witnesses, to speak out about the cheerful cause to which God has called us. Even in the face of a negative world all around us, we want to be the people who, through Jesus Christ, learn to offer hope and mercy and forgiveness to those who are in any kind of trouble. Isaiah starts out to get our attention, and he says what? Be strong and don't be afraid. I've never had the privilege of counting how many times Jesus told his disciples the same thing. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He must have gotten tired of saying it, and apparently they got tired of hearing it because a lot of times they got afraid. So Jesus today says to you and to me, in the face of all the obstacles that this world and the devil can throw at us, remember where you have been today. You've been to the foot of the cross to be in reminded that God in his grace sent his own son to Calvary to suffer and die for us so that we not only are forgiven, but that we want to become helpers of passing on that joy to everyone that we meet. Sometimes I'm afraid that in our society, we've really kind of lost our sense of humor. One time at a board of directors meeting in St. Louis, I had a devotion about that very point. And I said to the board of directors, we're either the craziest bunch of people in the world, or we really have our faith together. How can we possibly have a sense of humor with some of the problems that we have to deal with as leaders in the church. And so I reminded them that it's because we've been to the cross with Jesus that we can have a sense of humor. And it even says in the Bible that God sits in the heavens and laughs. He laughs at the like of us who aren't able to laugh even among ourselves. This morning then, Hear what Isaiah invites you to do, to get involved, to be the people of joy as you sung it here together, to go out into the streets, into your job, into your home, into your family relationships, and be the bearers and the bringers of the joy and the peace that Jesus Christ has given to each and every one of us today. When Isaiah says God will come, we are here to testify that he has come. He's come to us in the person of his son at Bethlehem. He's come to us at Calvary's cross. He's come to us at the empty tomb. And he comes to us today in word and in sacrament. And by doing what he has invited us to do, we know his Holy Spirit is at work within each and every one of our hearts to strengthen us to give us joy and to help us to be bearers and sharers of that joy. Amen. May that peace of God which passes all